Parshas Shemini, the third Parsha in the book of Leviticus, has 91 verses, 17 mitzvos, and it's going to continue with the theme of last week. At the end of the Parsha last week, we had the seven days of inauguration. The word Shemini means the eighth. This is the eighth day of inauguration. This is going to be the first day where the tabernacle is going to be operating under its normal rules and, and guidelines and procedures, and the Kohanim are going to t- finally take over, and they're going to be running the show. And the end of the parsha is going to be dedicated towards the laws of kosher, uh, what's kosher, which animals are kosher, and which animals are not kosher. So 91 verses and 17 mitzvos. Now Rashi reorients us at the beginning of the parsha. The parsha begins, it was on the eighth day, Moses summoned Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. This is the eighth day of the inauguration. Rashi tells us this is the first day of the month of Nisan. They left Egypt the previous year on the 15th day of Nisan. So this is 15 days shy of one year from when they left from the Exodus. This is a very special day. This is the day when the tabernacle is finally going to be erected for good. The first of the seven days of inauguration was the 23rd day of Adar, the previous month, and seven days of inauguration, and now this is the eighth day. This is the time where they're going to erect the tabernacle and not disassemble it. Now, the Talmud tells us that a lot actually happened on this day. It's a very fundamental, foundational day in Jewish people's history. In fact, the Talmud tells us, the book of Megillah, page 10b, that on this day, the day when the tabernacle was finally erected for good, this is a day in which the Almighty was as delighted as the first day of creation. And like we mentioned many weeks ago in Parshas Truma, where we started talking about the tabernacle, we mentioned that the Torah dedicates a tremendous amount of time and effort in describing how the tabernacle is built and, and the various vessels and everything related to it. And the reason why is because by the Torah's philosophy, what's happening here is a total recreation of the world. And this, in effect, is the equivalent of Genesis, like the Talmud says. The Talmud says that this day parallels, it mirrors the day of creation in that just like the day of creation was a day in which a world was created, so too this day the day where the tabernacle is finally completed, a new world is created. And of course, there's a lot of layers to this idea. But in the famous work Nefesh HaChayim uh, from Rabbi Chaim Velazhin, he writes that the Mishnah, the tabernacle, is a miniature model of the universe and of the human body. And in effect, when God created the world, it's his world, and he invited us to live in it, And the Mishnah, the tabernacle, is the exact thing in the opposite direction. We're creating this world. Of course, it's not the same kind of world that God created, but it's the same structure. And we're inviting God to dwell in the world that we built, so to speak, for him. And in effect, there is an achievement that was unlocked with the Mishnah, with the tabernacle, in which the presence of God was not hidden, it was not masquerading behind a facade of nature, in the tabernacle, the presence of God was palpable to all, was present to all, was tangible to all, and therefore the goal of creation, that God should be known to the world, to the people, was manifested in the tabernacle. So this is a very momentous day, the first day of Nisan in the year after the Jewish people left Egypt, this is the day in which a new era, a new chapter in world history began. Now, the Midrash tells us that a lot of other things actually happened on this day. So first of all, in the book of Numbers, we're going to read about the offerings of the heads of the tribe. There's 12 tribes. Each tribe has a prince or a president of the tribe, and each tribe brought an offering to celebrate the inauguration. So on this day was the first day of those 12 days of inauguration, and the head of the tribe of Judah, actually Aaron's brother-in-law, he brought the offering and then for the next uh, 12 days that repeated with all the other heads of the tribe. And the Midrash goes on to tell us that this is the first day of creation. This is the first day where God dwelled amongst the Jewish people. This is the first day in which you cannot have any private altars because the public altar is going to be inaugurated. All private altars are banned thenceforth. 
This is the first day where the high priests, Aaron and Aaron's sons, are going to be inaugurated as priests. This is the first day of blessing. This is the first day of worship. This is the first of the month. We know the first month of the Jewish calendar is the month of Nisan. And this is the first day in which God sent a divine heavenly fire down from heaven to consume the sacrifices upon the altar. This is the first day that all the other sacrifices began, the private sacrifices, the public sacrifices, the sacrifices of the individuals, the various donations, vows, sin offerings, guilt offerings, and other assorted sacrifices. Now, interestingly, as we mentioned last week, Moses was considered the high priest for the seven days of inauguration, and now he's going to transfer that over to Aaron. The Midrash tells us something very interesting. As we mentioned in the book of Exodus, Moses was initially supposed to be the high priest. He lost it, and it was transferred to Aaron. Why did Moses lose the high priesthood? He lost it because when God initially told Moses to go to Egypt, to go save the Jewish people, Moses was worried that Aaron, his older brother, would be offended and would be envious. But we know as the Torah goes on to tell us, that Aaron was very happy for Moses. He had no envy in his heart. And therefore, because Moses underestimated Aaron's piety, Moses lost the high priesthood and Aaron received it. The Midrash tells us that Moses was objecting to the role that God gave him for seven days. And therefore, Moshe was rejecting God because of Aaron. For seven days, and therefore his duration, his tenure as high priest, lasted for only seven days. After seven days of inauguration, Aaron is ensconced as the high priest. And on this day, a lot of sacrifices are going to be offered. Verse 2 tells us that Moses tells Aaron, bring a young bull for a sin offering, a ram for elevation offering, unblemished animals. And the children of Israel also bring a sacrifice. They bring a goat as a sin offering, a calf and a sheep, and various other offerings. Now, it's interesting. It begins with a calf, and we know there is some history amongst our people with a calf. And Rashi tells us that the reason why Aaron is bringing a a calf is because this is going to inform him that God forgave him via this calf. He forgave him for the golden calf that Aaron made. So one of the first sacrifices being offered here is a young bull, a a calf, and that is directed, it's oriented at reversing the misdeed of Aaron of the golden calf. Now, it's very interesting. Some of the sages asked uh, an interesting question. We know in Yom Kippur, that's the one day that the high priest, that Aaron, walks into the Holy of Holies. And we're told, and we'll read this a little bit later on in the book of Leviticus, that when Aaron walks into the Holy of Holies, he has to change his garments. We read about the the eight special golden garments of the high priest. And on Yom Kippur, when he walks into the Holy of Holies, he takes off those eight golden garments and puts on white garments. Why does Aaron not walk into the Holy of Holies wearing any gold. So the Talmud tells us that there's a principle that you cannot have a prosecutor turn into an advocate. You can have something like gold, which was the golden calf. You can't bring that and try to use that as advocacy, as lobbying God to forgive you. And therefore, Aaron has to take off the gold clothing before he walks into the Holy of Holies to pray for the Jewish people to be atoned. Yet here, we see that Aaron is taking a young calf, a young bull, as an offering. And that's going to repent, and that's going to provide expiation for the golden calf. I don't get it. How could you take something which was used for the sin and use that as the tool to arrive at repentance? Really interesting question that the Orachayim asks over here, one of the commentators. And there's several answers. I want to share three of them. I think there's some valuable lessons to be drawn from them. Number one Aaron did contribute towards the golden calf. But if you remember the story at the end of the book of Exodus, the story was that Aaron told everyone to bring in their gold. And then Aaron put the gold into a fire, but some of the mixed multitude, some of the Egyptians who jumped uh, on the bandwagon to join the Jewish people, they, via sorcery, turned that gold into the golden calf. 
So Aaron's role was to make the gold. And therefore, Aaron doesn't walk in with the gold itself because he was responsible for the gold component of the golden calf. Whereas the calf itself, that was produced by others and therefore that does not cause a problem of taking a prosecutor and turning it into an advocate and therefore he could offer a sacrifice of a calf. That's one answer. A second answer is that when you walk into the Holy of Holies, when you walk into the epicenter, to the absolute epitome of holiness, then you have to be careful to not have any scintilla of, so to speak, prosecution with you, to not bring any of your baggage. Whereas this sacrifice, it's a lower level sacrifice. It's not done in the Holy of Holies. It's processed out of the Holy of Holies. There, th- Therefore, it's not a problem. And the third answer is that on Yom Kippur, when the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, he's trying to get atonement for all the sins. And therefore, you don't want to bring in any prosecutorial aspects of the most egregious sin of our history. Whereas here, Aaron's trying to get atonement specifically for one sin, namely the sin of the golden calf. Therefore, he could bring a calf. And in fact, he should bring a calf because that's going to help contribute. This calf will fit for that calf. Now, our sages also tell us that the reason why a goat was offered as well, that is to repent for the sin of the selling of Joseph. And therefore, again, this is one of the national sins of the Jewish people. This is our big day. We want to clear the air. We're going to try to bring atonement for the sin of the golden calf and atonement for the other sin of our people, and that is the sin of selling Joseph. And the question maybe could be asked is that, you know, Aaron was from the tribe of Levi. And the tribe of Levi, Levi was one of the people that wanted to sell Joseph. In fact, Shimon and, and, and Levi, Shimon and Levi, they were the co-conspirators that were opposed to to Joseph. And therefore, how is Aaron the right person to offer this sacrifice? After all, he's from the tribe of Levi. Maybe we should find someone else, someone from the tribe of, of, of Joseph, maybe. I don't know. So perhaps the answer is that, you know, Aaron, he's the one person who exhibited more than anyone else that he did not have envy. With his brother, his brother was, younger brother was nominated to the greatest role, the greatest office of power, of leadership in our people, and Aaron was delighted in his heart. Therefore, he represents, he embodies the characteristic of being happy for someone else and not being envious, and therefore, there is no one better than Aaron to be the one to rectify, to repent for the sin of selling Joseph, which its roots were the brother's envy for Joseph. So Moshe tells them about all the various sacrifices that are going to be offered, a bull and a ram for a peace offering. All these are going to be slaughtered in the tabernacle. And there's going to be a meal offering mixed with oil. And finally, verse 4 tells us, for today, Hashem appears to you. Today, we're going to have the goal of it all. God is going to rest his presence in our handiwork, Rashi tells us. And this is a reference that these sacrifices that we're going to be offering to God, our handiwork, so to speak, they're going to be consumed by the divine fire. That's the plan. And verse 5, indeed, they implemented. They took what Moses had commanded to bring it to the tent of meeting. The entire assembly is there. Everyone's is waiting. Everyone's anticipating. And Moses says, this is the thing that Hashem has commanded you to do. Then the glory of Hashem will appear to you. That's one of the themes of the Parsha and maybe the themes of the entire tabernacle story. You follow the instructions and that will guarantee the desired result. And this is, I think, a broader theme in Judaism and in Torah. Some of the things that we're told to do don't really resonate with us. And we do them anyhow. And we do them because God is tailoring the message. And God is saying, you do this, you do that, and the desired results will come. How they will come, how will A lead to B, that's for God to worry about. How by us doing Torah, do we fix the world, do we achieve the goal of the Olam? That's for God to worry about. We follow our instructions and the results are not in our hands, they're in God's hands. But here we see a theme, you follow what you need to do and leave the rest to the Almighty. So Moses says to Aaron, come near to the altar and perform the service of your sin offering and your elevation offering. Provide atonement for yourself and for the people. So everyone's ready. Everything's assembled. And Moshe tells Aaron to come near. 
Rashi tells us, quoting from the Midrash, that Aaron was a little bit hesitant. He was scared. And Moshe encouraged him, and Moses encouraged him, don't be scared. This is why you were chosen. So Aaron's hesitant, and then Moshe is, is coaxing him into taking the role. This is your job. Go grab it by the horns. So why indeed was Aaron so hesitant? After all, this has been the plan all along. Aaron's going to be the high priest, and he's going to take the leadership role, and he's going to go run with it. Why is he suddenly hesitant? So the Ramban quotes a midrash. And the Midrash says that when Aaron got close to the altar, he saw the altar as an image of the ox. Meaning he saw the altar and to everyone else it looked like like an altar and to Aaron it looked like the golden calf. And the reason why, the Ramban explains, is because Aaron, a holy person, righteous person, his sole sin that he had on his docket was his contribution toward the golden calf. And he couldn't get past it. Everywhere he looked, he just saw calves. And it was present before him at all times. And Moshe had to encourage him, don't be so humble. Don't be so unconfident. You have to believe in yourself. You have to go ahead and you have to overcome those sins. And I think this is maybe a good lesson for us. One of the tactics of the Yetzirah of the Evil Chanation is to keep us at bay, to make us constantly wallow in the misery of our sin, to not be able to move past it and not be able to take the leadership that the Almighty has for us, the role that we have to play. Aaron was designed, was designated, was pointed out as the right man to be the high priest. He didn't believe himself, and Moshe had to encourage him. We too must realize that there's some role that we need to play, and we shouldn't allow our our baggage, so to speak, that we bring to the table to stop us. So Aaron has been emboldened and he comes and he comes to the altar and he slaughters the sacrifices and he processes the sacrifices. And we go through the exact details of what he did with all the animals, with all the fats, and with all the various innards. And he's processing the variety of offerings of his offerings, offerings of the people. And when everything's done, Aaron raises his hands towards the people. He blesses them. This is when he descends from the altar, he blesses them, the special priestly blessing. May God bless you. May God watch over you. May God show favor to you. May God give you peace. And he descends after doing the sin offering, the elevation offering, and the peace offering. And then Moses, this is verse 23, and Aaron came to the tent of meeting. They went out. They blessed the people. And the glory of Hashem appeared to the entire people. So a few things here are happening. In verse 23, it's Moses and Aaron are going into the meeting after Aaron has done all the hard work. And then they bless the people. So what's going on here? Why, why are they going back in again? So Rashi gives us two answers. The first answer, which I find really interesting, I didn't really see an explanation for this, is that Moses went in with Aaron to teach him how to do the ketores, how to do the incense offering. And I find this really maybe strange. You know, all the other variety of sacrifices and processes that we've read about, it seems like Aaron already knew going in. Somehow, with respect to the ketores, to the incense offerings, everyone's already waiting and, oh, now it's time to learn how to do that. I find that kind of interesting. That's the first explanation of Rashi, what happened here in verse 23. The second explanation is that Aaron, after he brought all the sacrifices, there was no revelation of God. The fire that everyone's been anticipating, the presence of God that everyone's been looking forward to, that didn't show up. And he was sad. And he said, I know that God's angry at me. And because of me, the Shekhinah, the divine presence, did not descend upon Israel. So he calls to Moses, Moshe, my brother, you put me in here to be embarrassed? Did you want me to, 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 to fail in front of everyone? So right away, Moshe goes in with him. They started praying, and the divine present descended upon Moses. They gave a blessing to the people. They blessed them that may the presence and the grace of God be present over your handiwork. And right away, in verse 24, a fire went forth from Hashem and consumed 
what was on the altar, the elevation offering and the fats. The people saw, the whole nation's there witnessing. They, they, they erupted in song. They were terrified. They fell upon their faces. This was an incredible experience of revelation and the two dueling emotions, the one of overwhelming joy and the one of tremendous trepidation, they captivated and captured the people. They were terrified on one hand and they were incredibly joyous on the other hand, which, by the way, the Ram tells us is the experience of prophecy. It's a simultaneous experience of love and fear, love and joy and excitement and ecstasy of talking to God and tremendous trepidation and even fear and and dread of talking to God. Both those competing emotions were experienced simultaneously by the nation. So this is really the end of the story. It seems like everything's gone exactly as expected. The eighth day was a resounding success, and that's what you would think until you open up chapter 10. This is on the same eighth day, amidst this zenith of ecstasy, amidst the jubilation, there's a disaster and there is a tragedy. The sons of Aaron, Nadav and Avu, Aaron has four sons, and these are the two of the sons of, of Aaron. They each took a fire pen, they put a fire in it, and they placed the incense upon it, and they brought before Hashem an alien fire that he had not commanded them. A fire came forth before Hashem and consumed them, and they died before Hashem. This is one of the saddest, most maybe incomprehensible stories in the Torah. This is the day of tremendous joy, a day of a culmination of all the hard work, really, of the last, you know, f- five, six months, building and assembling and constructing and following the orders to a T. And then when everything seems to have been completed, Nadav and Avil, the two sons of Aaron, two of the princes of the Jewish people, two people who are designated to be the next great leaders of the Jewish people, and they die because they do something off script, they bring a foreign fire, they bring an offering that God has not asked and God sends a fire and they are consumed and they died. And the Talmud and the commentaries is, everyone's trying to grapple and struggle with this story. What did they do wrong? Why why did this happen? And there's a whole variety, a whole bevy of answers given. So the Talmud tells us, quoted by Rashi, that they were punished because they didn't follow the law of Moses. They, they they deemed it necessary on their own. Moses was their teacher. They should have asked him. Or alternatively, they were they were drunk. Why? Because right afterwards, the very next section is the Torah telling us that you cannot do any work and any sacrifice in the tabernacle while drinking. Then maybe they weren't wearing the requisite clothing. The fire was originated from one place, not from the altar. They didn't consult Moses and Aaron. They didn't consult each other. Maybe they were guilty of hubris. Uh, They were impatient to assume the leadership role for themselves. In fact, the Midrash tells us that Nadav and Avio, these two sons of Aaron, they would stroll behind Aaron and Moses and they would say to each other, when will these two old people finally die so you and me can lead the nation? Uh, alternatively, the, this punishment, this death was actually a residual leftover punishment for Aaron's participation in the golden calf because he participated in the golden calf. He, all four of his sons should die, but in God's mercy, two of his sons survived. It's a very difficult thing and clearly the commentators are all trying to grapple with it. Others even suggest that all the way back at Sinai, again, almost a year prior, they were watching the presence of God, so to speak, yet they ate and they drank. They didn't have the proper reverence. But again, the simple words of the verse cannot be ignored, and that was they brought a fire and fire. They deviated from the precise instructions of God, and therefore that's what led to this uh, tragic result of them dying at this very important day. We're also told uh, by some of the other commentators, if you look, it says, uh, the sons of Aaron, Nadav and Avir, doesn't say Nadav and the sons of Aaron, maybe they didn't accord 
Aaron the proper respect, but that's what happened. They brought a an offering, an incense offering, and it was a foreign fire, and they died. And immediately after they died, verse 3, Moses tells something very striking to Aaron. And he says, this is what God referred to. When God said, I will be sanctified through those who are nearest to me, and I'll be honored before the entire people. Right after this happens, something clicks for Moses. All the way back in chapter 29 of Exodus, God told Moses that I'm going to be present in the tabernacle and I'm going to be elevated. I'm going to be exalted via the people who are close to me. So Moses understood that there's going to be some tragedy of someone who is very holy and very sanctified and very righteous and pious who's going to die and that's going to result in God being sanctified. And Moses tells Aaron, I thought it was either me or you. I thought that the person who's going to die is either me or you. Because God is going to be exalted via the death of the ones who are closest to him. And who's closer than Moses and Aaron. But now, says Moses to Aaron, I realize your sons, they were even closer. And that's, I think, part of of Moses' message of comfort to Aaron that his sons didn't die in vain. They died because they were beloved by God and the message of their death reinforced the sublimity and the holiness and the sanctification of the tabernacle itself. And when Aaron heard that, he was silent. He was stoic. He was like a stone, our sages tell us. He didn't question God. He accepted it. And consequently, Rashi tells us that he got rewarded. Why? Because right after the story, God spoke to Aaron and taught him a law of of the Torah. In fact, the most common verse in the Torah, by Daber Shem Moshe Lemur, God spoke to Moses saying, meaning go tell the Jewish people, it only once in the Torah does appear by Daber Shem El Aharon Lemur, God spoke to Aaron saying, and that's right after this story, God has a prophetic prophecy that he conveys to the Jewish people via Aaron. Why did Aaron merit to kind of be in Moses' place? Because of how he accepted what God had done to his sons. He didn't protest. He didn't ask questions. And he was stoic and he accepted the divine judgment, the punishment, so to speak. Maybe it didn't make sense to him. And we see like all the commentators trying to figure out what, what happened, what was so wrong. And the fact that they're, they can't pin it down to any one thing, it's, it's clearly there's something beyond, there's some sort of godly calculation that we can't just isolate one reason. Aaron didn't understand why God did that to him, but he accepted it and therefore he got rewarded for it. Yes, this event was foreshadowed. Moses thought it was either me or you, but he realized that they were greater than Moses and Aaron and the net result is that there was sanctity. Uh, the death of Nadav and Aviyu brought sanctity to the tabernacle because everyone realized that if you walk too close to the fire, so to speak, you are going to get singed. These people, Nadav and Aviyu, they were greater than Moses and Aaron, the Torah tells us. Yet even those people, they can't get too close because God's presence is literally there. And that's amazing. But it also means there's a certain degree of seriousness to this location, and everyone took that message home. Well, what now? We have the two bodies of the deceased. They're still in the tabernacle. So Moses summons their cousins and tells them, go carry out your brothers, and they carry them out by their tunics outside their camp. And it's interesting that their tunics are still extant. So Rashi quotes the Talmud, that this proves to us that they died with a fire, but a fire that did not singe their garments. And the Talmud, the book of Sanhedrin, tells us that there were two ropes of fire that exited from the Holy of Holies and entered through their nostrils and burned them internally. It kind of consumed their soul, but not their body. 
the body was unaffected, neither was their clothing, and therefore they are pulled out by their clothing from the sanctuary. So what do we have? This is the first day of the normal operations of the tabernacle. Aaron just lost two of his sons. Aaron's sons, the other two remaining sons, Elazar and Itamar, they have lost their brothers. And normally, under normal circumstances, these people, they're mourners. And mourners, they have certain limitations. What could, what could they do? What could they do in the temple? What could they not do? What could they do in the tabernacle? What could they not do? Then typically, they're supposed to mourn. And yet, Moses tells them, no, you cannot mourn. There's a special law here today. This is the inauguration day. This is a day where we're going to make an exception and there's not going to be any mourning and you may not leave the premises of the tabernacle and the rest of the Jewish people. They will do the mourning for you. And in the aftermath of this tragedy, we read about God telling Aaron, do not drink intoxicating wine, not you, not your sons, not for the rest of the generations. And then come into the tent of meeting, then come to the tabernacle and subsequently the temple, because if you do that, you will die. In order to distinguish between the sacred and the profane, between the contaminated and the pure, and to teach the children of Israel all the decrees that Hashem has spoken to them through Moses. So this is the message conveyed to Aaron against intoxicants. And then the rest of the chapter deals with the aftermath of this story, because Now we still have parts of the sacrifices that were not consumed and we have the two sons of Aaron lost their brothers. They are mourners. Aaron lost his son, his sons. So he's a mourner. Are they allowed to still consume that? There are laws governing what a mourner, a Cohen who is a mourner is allowed to consume and not. And there was a little bit of a disagreement because the sons of Aaron, they actually burnt the sacrifice instead of consuming it, and Moses gets a little bit upset with them. He inquires in verse 16, why did you burn it? And he got angry at Elazar and Itamar, the sons of Aaron that were remaining. Why did you not eat it? So Aaron responds that even though I was allowed to eat it, we were allowed to uh, sacrifice it, process it, because of this one-off exception, but the monthly standard monthly sacrifice that is brought every month, so it's not special to this day, those they weren't sure if they're allowed to do it. And uh, Aaron also adds that he was allowed to process it, but not necessarily to consume it, and Moses buys his arguments. This is uh, chapter 10 of Leviticus. Again, it's the height of the joy of the inauguration. It's the day where the transfer from Moses to Aaron and Aaron's sons is complete and it is sullied almost by this tremendous tragedy with the death of the sons of Nadav and Avihu and the variety of reasons as to why that may have happened. From here on out, the rest of the Parsha, uh, chapter 11, is going to be talking about uh, the laws of kosher animals and various laws related to the laws of purity and impurity. And the chapter begins... God spoke to Moses and to Aaron, telling them to go tell the Jewish people, speak to the Jewish people and tell them, these are the creatures that you may eat from among all the animals that are upon the earth. And Rashi tells us something very fascinating. The creatures, these are the creatures. The Hebrew word for that is chaya. Chaya means animals as a group, as a category. But the word chaya comes from the word chayim, which means life. Says Rashi, something fascinating that the reason why the laws of kosher, they have this preamble, this is the life, because the Jewish people, they cleave to God. And to them, it's worthy to have life. And therefore, the Almighty separated us from things that are impure and commanded us to do mitzvos. Whereas to the non-Jews, who are not cleaving to God, who are not cleaving to life, they, they were not given the laws of kosher, because they don't need it. And Rashi tells us that the Midrash gives us a an analogy to explain this idea. But the idea is that, you know, if you were to look on a molecular level, 
the non-kosher food is not necessarily harmful. I mean, some of them are. We know the pig likes to eat trash and you eat that and you get the influence of it and it's not healthy. You know, we like grass-fed beef. It's better. But as a general rule, it's not about the health of the body. And this is what Rashi is invoking. There is, of course, the body, but we also are composed of a soul. And just like your body needs life, needs sustenance, needs nourishment to have continuity, your soul also has to be alive. And how does a soul get nourished? You know, the body's physical and the body needs physical nourishment to have continuity. Well, the soul, the soul is spiritual and therefore the soul needs spiritual nourishment for continuity. What does Rashi say? Rashi says, according to the Midrash, that the Jewish people, we cleave to God. The infusion of vitality, of life, of sustenance, of nourishment to our soul comes when someone cleaves to God. That is the pipeline via which the soul is fed. And therefore, because our soul is alive, we cannot consume these animals, these foods that could harm the vitality, not of our body, but of our soul. And in the Midrash that Rashi invokes, the Midrash gives us an analogy. And uh, it's an analogy of a physician, of a doctor, who goes to visit two patients. And one of them is terminally ill. They're going to die. And the physician tells the people in charge there, he could eat whatever he wants. Whereas the second patient, maybe they're dealing with a uh, an illness, but they're still going to live. And therefore, he tells the family, he should eat this, and he should eat this, and he should not eat that. And they said to the physician, wait a minute, how come you told the other guy, the other patient, eat whatever he wants? And this one, you said not to eat all these restrictions. So the physician responds, well, one of them has life. And therefore, if you have life, you should have a certain diet that maintains them, that encourages that. But the one who's already going to die, is already dead, you give him whatever you want because he's not, he's not alive anyhow. Similarly, explains the Midrash, the non-Jews who are not cleaving to God, well, they could eat all manners of animals. It doesn't matter to them because their soul is not connected to the root of life to God. And consequently, they don't have that life to lose. And therefore, they get whatever they want. Whereas the Jewish people, they are cleaving to God. God is holy. They're holy. Therefore, they should not corrupt their souls by eating non-holy things or foods that could be harmful to their souls. And therefore, these laws are governing what we should put within ourselves that does not harm our soul. And Rashi also tells us, really interesting, that if you look at the Hebrew words, it says, zos hachaya, this. Every time it says the word zos or ze, our sages explain to us, it means a visual representation of something. This is the animal. So Rashi tells us that Moses actually had a live demonstration. Every animal, he would lift one of them up and say, this one's kosher, this one's not kosher. The, the method of instruction was not, you know, in a classroom, so to speak. It was hands-on in a, a very tangible way. Moshe showed them what was kosher and what was not kosher. And we're given here rules in verse 3 to 7. The rules are for animals and it has to have a completely split hoof and it has to re-chew its cud, meaning that after it chews food, it actually regurgitates it and chews it a second time and then it, it swallows it. Those are the rules for kosher animals. These are the requirements. It has to be both an animal that has split hooves and an animal uh, that re-chews its cud. So for example, we beef, uh, cows are kosher. If you look at a cow close up, it has complete split hooves, and if you follow it after it eats, you can see it's always chewing in long, longer after because it chews it and then spits it back up into his mouth and chews it again. Now, the Torah also gives us some exceptions. It gives us three animals that chew their cud but don't have split hooves, and that's the camel and two other animals, which is a little bit of a dispute what exactly it is. Uh, they, they are, there's the Shafan and the Arnevet. These are animals like, like the camel that chew their cud, but don't have split hooves. And there's one exception to the opposite direction. That's the pig. It has the split hooves, but it doesn't chew its cud. 
Now, it is kind of interesting if you kind of look at the picture of this message. It gives us a rule and then it gives us four exceptions to those rules. And the question is, well, just give us the rule and we know that you have to have both. And therefore, the camel who has one and the pig that has the other one, but they don't have both, we know that they're exceptions. Why do we need to be told the rule and four exceptions? So the Talmud tells us something very fascinating, that any animal that chews its cud and is not one of these three exceptions explicitly mentioned in the Torah, well, then you know for sure it's kosher. Why? Says the Talmud. There's only three animals in existence that have cud chewing but not split hooves. And conversely, there's only one animal that has split hooves and doesn't chew its cud and that's only the pig. And in addition, the Mishnah tells us, at least according to some interpretations of the Mishnah, that if you see an animal that has horns in it, you already know for sure it's a kosher animal since all horned animals are kosher. I think this is kind of fascinating if you look at it in context. You know, this is a very ancient document. We believe the Torah is more than 3,300 years old as given to, the, to us, given to the Jewish people. And yet, there is this very confident statement here that we see and brought down in the Talmud, again, thousands of years old, that even though there's thousands, tens of thousands, who knows how many animals in the world, we could say definitively that there's only three of them that have these this characteristic that they chew, chew their cud and don't have the split hooves. And there's only one that has this one, meaning split hooves, but does not chew its cud. And I, I think it's a good challenge. You know, if someone wants to question, God forbid, the divinity of the Torah, they have to kind of wonder, you know, how is it possible if... Uh, like some people believe that the Torah has human authorship, not divine authorship, how would someone have the confidence to make uh, such a bold statement uh, to know that there isn't any animal in existence, you know, thousands of years ago? And it's kind of remarkable that uh, someone was able to do that. And uh, for us, it's it's simple. Well, God wrote it and God made the animals and therefore God knows. But if someone questions that premise – it's a question on them. How is it possible uh, for someone to, you know, point specifically? These three animals are the exception one way, and that uh, that fourth animal is the exception another way. And there's no other. Really fascinating. So that's the laws of what constitutes a kosher animal. And then we read about the kosher fish. The kosher fish has to have fins and scales. Now, as a general rule, with all these laws of kosher. Uh, these are things that we don't necessarily understand. You know, why does split hooves and why chewing cud? Like, what's the meaning behind that? It's just, you know, that's what we get from the Torah. Why fins? Why scales? But maybe we could even suggest that, you know, the fins help a fish swim against the tide, swim upstream. Maybe there's a lesson for us that this is a kosher animal, this is a kosher attitude. You know, for us as Jews are constantly living in, in, in conflict or facing at least resistance. We have all these other influences in the world and we have all those headwinds facing us. We have to hit the lesson of the kosher fish that we also have to kind of grow our fins to be able to swim upstream, to be able to flourish in the face of opposition. Incidentally, the Talmud tells us, and this is a continuation of the previous theme, all fish that have scales necessarily have fins. But not all fish that have fins have scales. Again, a question, you know, how would Moses or whatever human author, if there was a human author, how would they know that? It's, of course, an unanswered question for people who don't believe in the divinity of the Torah. So that's animals and fish. And we read about birds and other insects. Then it lists uh, 20 different birds that are not kosher, which implies that all the other birds are kosher. And the problem is that we don't exactly know the translation of these 20 birds. So it's a custom for us to not eat any birds unless we have a tradition that they are okay. The Ramban tells us that what's unique about these 20 species of birds is that they are all birds of prey. And therefore, because they have cruelty by killing other birds and other animals and eating them, there's something spiritually cruel about these animals, and if we were to consume them, we would kind of imbibe, we would swallow, we would absorb some of their cruelty, 
and therefore God tells us not to eat them. Now with the insects, we also get all kinds of identifying marks and it's uh, somewhat unknown, especially in the Ashkenazic world, exactly what constitutes a kosher insect, which grasshoppers are okay, which grasshoppers are not okay. And therefore, unless you have a firm tradition, you shouldn't eat it. From what I've heard uh, from people on the Sephardic side who still have a custom to, to eat certain grasshoppers, they're fantastic, very crunchy, and uh, we hope they they enjoy them. But it's not something that uh, uh, Ashkenazic Jews uh, generally don't don't eat that. So those are the general categories of animals and, and, and kosher, of course. It does not talk about kosher processing, milk and meat. We've seen a few times already, but uh, this is not the comp- comprehensive take on laws of kosher. But there's a lot of, uh, of the classifications of which animals are okay, which ones are not, that we're told over here. Afterwards, read about uh, various uh, very complicated, very draconian laws related to purity and impurity. If vessels become impure and contamination and all these laws and, and various laws that encourage everyone who wants to read it to, to read, read it with Rashi, it's, it's very comprehensive and somewhat uh, complicated and difficult. And then we go back to the Torah circles back to the contamination that is inherent in uh, non-kosher animals. And we read in verse 41, every teeming creature that it teems upon the ground is an abomination, don't eat it. Everything creeps on its belly, like the snake, Rashi tells us. Everything walks on four legs, like a dog. These things we don't eat. They're an abomination. And then verse 43, do not make your souls abominable by means of any teeming thing. Do not contaminate yourself through them, lest you become contaminated through them. For I am Hashem your God. You shall sanctify yourself. You should be holy. I am holy. Again, via eating kosher food, we're going to be like God. That's what's insinuated over here. You not contaminate your souls through any teeming thing that creeps on the earth. For I much will elevate you from the land of Egypt to be a god unto you. You shall be holy, for I am holy. The Talmud tells us in the book of Yoma that when it says, "Do not contaminate yourself," velo titamu vinitmeitem. Don't read really vinitmeitem. Rather, vinitamtem. Says the Talmud, we have a soul. Our soul is like a flame of God. It's a beacon of connection, of spirituality. However, via eating non-kosher food, God forbid, our soul becomes dull, it becomes weakened, it becomes less potent and less powerful, not only here, but in Olam Abba, but in the world of the souls, our soul is going to be weakened, it's going to be diminished by consumption of non-kosher. And it's an important statement that we read in the Masila Sharm in the book of The Path of the Just or The Way of the Upright of Ram Chal. He tells us that consumption of non-kosher food, they infuse impurity in the heart and the soul of man to the degree that the holiness of God, it vanishes from him, it distances himself from him and he quotes the Talmud and he says that's just like sin banishes God from man, it creates a barrier between man and God. It dulls man's heart. So too, that is present with non-kosher. Someone who does those things, they lose their spiritual components. They become animalistic. They become materialistic. They become submerged in this world and their soul loses its vitality and then it concludes that these sins are the worst sins because you are what you eat and therefore eating on kosher becomes part of you and this impurity will actually be imparted, will be embedded within you. Now, there's some interesting stories I always like to share when talking about kosher about the, the harmful influence of, of non-kosher. There was a Mishnaic sage by the name of Alicia Benavuya and he's the only one of his era that abandoned Torah observance and became a heretic. In fact, he's known in Talmudic literature as Acher, meaning the other one. And all the commentaries are trying to figure out what's the origin. How is it possible that this great sage went awry and abandoned Torah? And he was the teacher of Rabbi Meir, but somehow he went off and he got corrupted. And the Talmud and Tosfos in Hadiga 15a tells us that his fall from glory, it began before he was born. When he was still in utero, his mother passed an idolatrous temple. 
and she was smelling the pork that was being cooked inside. And she had a craving, and she was overcome with desire, and she went inside, and she partook in it. And our sages tell us that the forbidden meat quivered within her like a venom of a poisonous snake, and that, so to speak, infected her unborn child. And therefore, as a result, when this child was born, there was something corrupt within him. His soul was imperfect, and therefore he was susceptible for uh, for going awry, for going off, for deviating from the path. Now, there's another story, uh, maybe to the opposite effect, and this is a story from the 130s. This is during the Hadrianic persecutions at a time where the Roman emperor and his cohorts, they had placed several anti-Jewish legislation, uh, edicts against our people. They forbade us from studying Torah. They forbade us from doing the new moon and conferring a smicha, rabbinic ordination, uh, from teacher to student. But one of the things that he banned was circumcision. And at that time, there was a young boy who was born. And of course, he was circumcised. And he was from the most illustrious, prestigious family of Jewish people, direct descendant of King David. And his father and grandfather and great-grandfather were all the Nassim, the presidents, the princes of the Jewish people, going back to Hillel. And this young boy named Judah, he was circumcised. But the Romans, they said, okay, we have to bring this Judah to, to Rome. We want to inspect to see if he's circumcised. And what would happen if they found that he was circumcised? They would throw him and his mother off a roof and kill them both. And along the way, the Midrash tells us that as the mother is bringing her infant child to Rome, she meets a Roman woman, also with a brand new infant baby. And they talk to each other, and eventually the Roman woman finds out why, why, why this Jewish woman is undertaking this journey, and they decide to swap babies. And Rabbi Judah the Prince, who becomes Rabbi Judah the Prince, his mother carries this Gentile baby, shows him and his uncircumcised body to the Romans, and then eventually swap babies back. And our status tell us that that Gentile baby grew up to be the greatest of the Roman emperors, Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, who became a friend of Rabbi Judah the Prince, and in fact, according to Jewish sources, converted to Judaism. And our status tell us, what merit, what spiritual merit did Antoninus have that drew him to, to Judaism was the fact that for some time, he nursed from a righteous woman and that that food that went in him, that created holiness within him and that eventually played itself out when he converted and became a great ally of the Jews and a friend and study partner of Rabbi Judah the Prince. And it shows us the, the power here. And we, this, this theme is reiterated here. I am Hashem your God. Sanctify yourself. You'll be holy. Be holy because I am holy. I've taken you out from the land of Egypt. I'm I'm telling you, this is going to contaminate your souls. Don't do it. Be like me. I am holy, and you shall be holy as well. This is the law of the animal, the bird, every living creature that swarms in the water, every creature that teems in the ground to distinguish between the contaminated and the pure, between the creature that may be eaten and the creature that may not be eaten. Thus concludes our Parsha. And that's a wrap. And uh, again, the email address is rabbiwalby.gmail.com. The website is rabbiwalby.com. There are six different podcasts for you to enjoy. Parsha podcast, Jewish history podcast, Torah 101, Eternal Ethics, the Mitzvah podcast, and of course, the original podcast, This Jewish Life. I thank you all for listening and look forward to next week. Shabbat Shalom.